Well, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague of mine from Purdue, and it's Professor Sylvie Broder. Uh, she is a professor of agronomy, and Sylvia's research area addresses implications for converging U U.S. biofuel and food security agendas by developing field to landscape analysis of the potential for dedicated energy crops to provide renewable fuel on marginal lands while protecting natural resources and food or feed productivity. A core theme of her research is quantitative assessment of synergies and trade-offs among productivity and environmental objectives. In her research, she concentrates on nitrogen, carbon, and potassium and evaluates the practicality of all systems and management practices and ecological viability and sustainability. She earned a doctorate in ecology from the University of California, Davis, and her bachelor's degree from here at Harvard. I uh, just want to, before she comes to the podium, Sylvia is probably one of our most mm, energetic collaborators within the libraries. She and her colleague, Jeff Olenek, have been working with uh, our librarians, our library faculty, especially Marianne um, Stowell-Brocky, in looking at the data management issues. And I still remember one of my first conversations with Sylvie when I was just trying to understand what was going on in, um, and what was particular challenges to researchers in various areas of science and technology and other fields. And Sylvie, you have uh, field sensors. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> she was telling me that, oh, we have to go in and clean up our data. Um, the data is not always what we can actually let out. I hope I'm not saying anything that you're going to be talking about today. And, uh, and I said, oh, give me an example. And she said, well, our field sensors will be going along just fine, and then all of a sudden there will be this huge spike. And, and we have to go out and we figure out that it was either some uh, mink or a, a raccoon or someone that got into the sensor and messed it all up. And, uh, and so we have to go out and then equalize that back out again. And I thought, hmm, I never would have thought about the issues of wildlife messing up science. So I guess it does. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And I just click forward. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, uh, Jim, for the kind introduction. In thinking about what I would talk to you about, uh, I w have been all along quite a bit concerned that you will find my comments painfully unsophisticated when it comes to data. I, I would, so I will acknowledge that up front. But I would also like to make two points. The first is I am real. Uh, I may actually be a higher order of species uh, when it comes to my domain. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that while this is completely untested, I'm pretty sure my thinking is a lot more sophisticated than a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but that's untested. Te so uh, what, what I hope to offer to you today is some comments on what is quite a long journey. And Jim gave yesterday a very eloquent uh, analogy with uh, Greeks and long journeys of, uh, in our literary history. Uh, we, I think our, our persistent players, who I have identified down here, uh, tend to think of this more as a board game. And I know that at least Marianne Brackey, by the way, the uh, purple are those of the library science persuasion, and these are of the agronomic persuasion. And agronomy is an agricultural science. It is not astrology. It is not astronomy. Uh, it is the study of agricultural sciences. Um, it, it's, a common, it's a commonly misunderstood term. Anyway, we think of it more, I th I, Marianne gave a presentation at National Ag Libraries, and she used chutes and ladders as an analogy of the, the, the trip we've been on. Uh, I decided to think more explicitly about our particular board game that we are still someplace on. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we are, 
but uh, we've been traveling along. We've been supported extensively by uh, those who I wouldn't, I didn't list as persistent players because they have their own agendas, but their agenda has dovetailed. They've been helpful. There's an enormous group um, that has been helpful, starting off with our own uh, associate dean for research in the College of Agriculture, uh, Dean Karen Plowd, uh, and then Dean Mullins, Michael Witt, who's in the audience, in the back there. Uh, Paul Fixen is with the International Plant Nutrition Institute that works with the fertilizer industry. Jake Carlson has departed Purdue. That's why he doesn't get to be a persistent player anymore, because he didn't persist with us. Anyway, our particular board game uh, has had these, you know, w we got started. And we got started, actually, I date my start on this back to about 2000. And so it predates Jim's arrival at Purdue and actually putting some oomph into the data, into the data agenda. Um, but I will explain where we started. But very quickly, we, you know, we had some great ideas. And we were naive, we were happy, we were enthusiastic, and we got cut off at the knees. And I very clearly recall the first proposal, which I still have, which everybody said, oh, this is a great proposal. Michael Witt was involved, and w we were all excited about it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it was rejected. And so we, we meandered on, along on our way doing little Purdue pilots. But we, we, we constantly encountered things we didn't e expect that, that cut off what we assumed were shortcuts. And I'll talk a little bit about our, our millennials and what we think they will think about data, which isn't, doesn't seem to be what they do. Uh, I'm, a data, I'm a data hobbyist. I have a day job. I have to keep my program running. And so constantly I've got to be writing grants for other things. And I'll talk about USDA, where I get a lot of money, and what they think about data management planning. There have been natural hazards that we've had to, um, we haven't expected, that we've had to move around, sacred cows. Let's talk about a few of those. There have also, uh, who wouldn't find Brad Pitt encouragingly directional, but there have been moments when we, we've, we've been encouraged by what we're doing, so we stick with the board game, but we're not there yet. Uh, sorry. So moving along, just to give you a little bit more insight about what I do, because if I don't explain what I do, I'm not sure you'll, you'll understand my perspective on data. But I work on, on plants not animals, and I view them as factories. And factories produce what we want to uh, take out of agriculture. And typically, you can break it down into a few different things. And we can put those to a, a variety of economic products. And the pathways to get from, from a plant to, a, to a, a, uh, uh, an element, starch or sugar, to an uh, economic product, there's no one pathway. And what we grow here or anywhere is largely a consequence of, these are the agro-ecozones of the US, so it's largely a consequence of, of uh, places that are similar in the natural resource base um, and you know, weather, climate, uh, uh, temperature regimes, all those things, soils that go into making something similar from a plant or animal's perspective. And then it's our ability to modify it. And I'm not going to go into all the extensive modifications that we do, but uh, agriculture has been highly engineered. And so if we want something, it's been clear that for the most part so far, we can get it if we really try. Uh, and I think you've been reading New York Times. I, if, we, if we really try, we can grow almonds, almonds in California. We have to provide them with a bunch of water. That's a choice thus far we've chosen to make. Um, but it has uh, huge environmental consequences, natural resource allocation uh, consequences, and therefore uh, food insecurity issues, poverty, hunger, if you look at a more global perspective and not just think about the US. So that's the, that's the perspective with which I look at, at science. That's what I do. I think about those kinds of questions. OK, Jim met, encountered me and my data problem because I also direct uh, a core facility at Purdue, which is this water quality field station. And I inherited the task of directing there when I was still an assistant professor. So it's not an honor. It's got clearly an albatross. 
Um, and it was and is often a bleak landscape. This is actually wintertime. Uh, some poor student is out there collecting data. And we do have to send people to collect data. Not everything is sensorized. And when I inherited it, it certainly was a bleak landscape without a data management plan safety net. We have tried and tried to implement various data uh, workflows and mechanisms that might eventually take us to an, a fully implemented data management plan that somebody would recognize as such, but we are still struggling. And I just wanted to, I've got a quick, quick little, It's okay, it's not critical, it's very short. Ah, technology. Never mind. Fine. That's okay. Okay, so what you would have heard is the sound of data relentlessly being collected because you hear ch -ch -ch -ch, and right now I can guarantee you that it's going ch -ch 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 -ch, and there's water splashing everywhere and each of those little tips is a liter, uh, 1.5 liters of water that has moved through an, a, a, a known region of the soil profile in an in a agricultural treatment plot and we are uh, collecting information on the volume that is sent. We have to send people still out there to crawl down in these basements and physically collect an aliquot of that stuff to take back to the lab for analyses. We spent a lot of time looking at sensor technology, waiting uh, for the moment when something will allow the things that we're interested in to be sensed but that has yet to come, at least in a, in a cost-effective way. In fact, there are some things that we can't, bacteria, the antibiotics, hormones uh, that move in water, that might be in the, in the soil that move to water that we'd be interested in. And indeed, this facility was set up in 1993 uh, specifically to try to understand agriculture as a function of the environment and its impacts back on the environment. This was, uh, it, you know, the 80s. 70s, lots of bad influences known to be happening, bad things happening to water, and clearly agriculture was a part of it. It isn't the only part of it. We do lots of terrible things, but the, um, the, of the resource base in this system, the water is really the tough nut to get your hands around, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So this facility is extensive infrastructure. It is a built facility. It involved ex excavation, et cetera. Um, and th the focus is on water, obviously, because of all the stuff that could be in agriculture, in manures, in chemicals that we put on fields. When it was established, there was a lot of concern about atrazine and pesticides. Uh, since then, we have learned that much of the other things that we may put on in a, what we assume is a benign management practice may do terrible things to, to drinking water because uh, here's, a, here's what we do in the Midwest. This is the, the last bit of the, the story that you need to know about the system and its importance, and that is uh, we, we are the most heavily agriculturally drained area in the U.S. And what that is is that it's raining out there it, right now. It rained last night. It rained three inches on the weekend. You have to dispose of water from agricultural fields at this time of year. We're all, we also suffer from drought in, in the s middle of the summer, but at this time of year, you literally can't farm if you can't get rid of the extra water. So you place tile lines about a meter down in the soil, running through the field, and they drain into surface water, which in many cases is used as drinking water along, this is the Mississippi watershed, and lots of places use use surface water for drinking water, and then it gets to the Gulf of Mexico, and I'm sure you've heard about the hypoxic or the dead zone in Mexico. That is all about tile drainage and what we're pumping um, out of ag fields. Okay, so 
facility established back in 1993, just a picture. It, it, it looks, you fly over it, it looks like a farm field. Uh, you get a little closer, you'll see that we do have little huts and they are equivalent to um, slum huts. They're like little handy huts. They have a bunch of instrumentation inside. They have their little power sources. Rodents love to live in there, snakes love to live in there. We are constantly, snakes, uh, snakes like the rodents, the rodents like the wires. And so we are constantly battling things. You cannot um, trap a mink without a wildlife permit most of the times of the year. So if I get a mink, I have to hire somebody. So that's the, the mink problem. Um, okay. <laughs> I have to hire a wildlife specialist to dispose of mink in spite of all the people who would like to do away with the mink on their own. Okay. Um, we measure and monitor all kinds of stuff. And so we have data, we have physical samples coming into the lab uh, year round. We have things coming in on sensors year round. Our data aren't necessarily very big, they are disparate. We have field notes, we have uh, things when equipment fails, when recording equipment fails and somebody whips out a piece of, of old style data paper and starts recording on the spot. And let me tell you, we always have that in the truck because Equipment fails so often, pencils never fail or pens never fail. We ask a lot of really important questions and this will come back because um, we have a lot more data than we will ever use ourselves. That is the point of these sort of field facilities. There are many in the U.S. that are monitoring. The, U the Agricultural Research Service just started a new network kind of pulling together 11 similar types of facilities that have long-term data records. Um, there's a big network called NEON that is about monitoring natural environments. And so those sorts of data have a variety of use. And um, when, <laughs> it, the, the only reason I'm interested in directing stuff at a facility like this is because those data have a variety of use. But, uh, and this is true almost everywhere. There, if you look at these sorts of monitoring facilities, trying to understand the inter interaction between anthropogenic activity, uh, uh, the natural ecosystem, and some resources, climate change, critical questions that we're interested in. Most of them, um, the business model uh, is, is basically non-existent. Um, and typically, there has been a, a it's, almost universal that data have been underfunded, under-resourced, generally trivialized, like, okay, when, when, we, when we get the people there and we've got all the stuff on hand, then we'll figure out what to do with the data. And um, if, if, if legacy data is, is the key attribute of the facility's value, it really seems backward. But that's the way most of these facilities operate. Um, in terms of of keeping such a facility going, it is a constant begging, right? You write grants, but then you have to beg to keep the thing going. And the hardest thing to um, support is the human resource, and that's the corporate memory. And you turn over technicians, you turn over, graduate students turn over, you hope. Uh, you turn over people, you, you lose your data record because of how we do it so far. You can't. You can't expect your data record right now, you, the current way we approach it, to be persistent with human resource turnover. And yet that is the hallmark of the facility. Um, we, data curation and preservation has definitely been, you know, uh, it requires human resources. I will point out that even storage, which everybody says, Marianne tells me, storage now is cheap. It's the preservation and curation that's expensive. Even storage, we haven't always been able to manage in a way that wouldn't just like blow your mind if I told you what we actually did, which is not quite taking it home to keep in my garage, but almost. I mean, we don't have anything that, that, is, that is solid that would meet anybody's standard of secure. Um, and we have not had a policy of contributions of money to, for data reuse. I can persuade people to write me into the grant to do stuff to collect more data that they will then use, and I can get them to return the data to the, to the facility's database. But how do I get people to write money in 
for this sort of data that already exists if we don't have a business model that says, if you want to buy this data from me, buy it. Uh, and so um, <laughs> I just I stuck this in to remind myself to say this, that along this journey that I've been on, I've been, you know, alternately, I'm like, is this just, is it just too easy and nobody wants to waste their time on helping me with this? Or is it just, is it just too hard and nobody wanna wants to admit that they can't tell me, so they're like, yeah, 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 we'll help you. And then that's it. Um, so where did we start? I actually started with this idea of can we sell the data? I thought, okay, if data really are, you know, if it's data in general, not the singular datum or whatever, but if data globally is versus R, if data is an asset, right? Databases, whatever. Um, if, if they are an asset, <laughs> uh, um, why can't we sell them? You know, but Purdue has supported, it, it owns the data, the field station data, it owns them. Um, it should recover costs for it. Okay, so I said to the dean, I said, don't you guys wanna recover some money from this stuff? Can't we sell it? And the dean said, go talk to the attorneys. Okay, so uh, we had a rather novel meeting with the attorneys who were honestly quite surprised and perplexed to see us, had a tough time understanding what we were asking, but eventually we got to this point where, okay, there are some possible models for you to sell, sell the stuff, but, but how would you decide who to charge? You don't wanna charge your, your close colleague here, right? They're almost a collaborator, and they might be a collaborator if you gave it to them for free, and then you'd get, a, you'd get credit. Um, or, uh, you know, so how would you decide to charge? Just people you didn't know? That seems sort of arbitrary. Um, how would you price it? Well, I had no idea. But I've since learned that maybe you just price it and see what happens. Uh, but, but, you know, how would you price it? And, and then who's gonna wanna buy it? And the, prob the problem there is that it's something that's always been free. And you know if you have something new that has never been free before, people will buy it. But if it's always been free, they're like, why are you charging me? Why should I pay you anything for this? I'm sure I can find somebody else to get it for free from. Um, but so, so it's, it, it didn't have clear intellectual property potential. It was much too vague and messy. And so they couldn't figure out, they couldn't tell me with any sort of you know, um, uh, <laughs> certainty that this was a good idea and they clearly wanted us to go away, which I guess it's a good thing. A lawyer wants you to go away, go away. Um, the, there's also this additional problem that cost centers are notoriously difficult to set up. It has to do with the previous questions. Who are you gonna charge? How much are you gonna charge? Why are you gonna charge that much? Uh, justify it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we then moved on. Okay, we still had a storage problem. And I have to admit, I, I like books. My dad was a publisher. I like libraries. I'm like, okay, you know, it's like that place where you get free stuff. Let's see what, let's put it in the library. Um, you know, it, why not? Papers go there. For me, data, uh, were a natural sort of e-evolution, if I'm thinking about what a library might do in the future, while maybe, you know, we, we have a lot of data. On, we have a lot of documents, white, gray literature, uh, that has entered into libraries, and some of it's been pitched, but. Um, so, you know, I also had this notion, at, because I was an assistant and then an associate professor, and I had struggled, this is the question, who wants your data? Well, if a full professor can get it for free from an assistant professor, and I even had people going to my department head saying, Sylvie has this data, she won't give it to me. I'm like, I can't even get it neatened up for, for you to understand it, and you want me to give it to, I've since learned you just give it to them. And then they come back and they say, well, I can't say, tell what it means. Well, you just give it to them, let them figure it out. I, I, I wasn't that smart then, and I had spent a lot of time helping people access the data and not receive an iota of credit for it. And I was like, okay, this is bad news. Like, you know, the story of the, uh, of the Jeff Boland story yesterday of the pH meter. Uh, you know, what is pH? It's what a pH meter reads. What is scholarship? It's what the promotion and tenure committee says is scholarship. It's that simple. So when I'm asked this question about how will we make people value the scholarship of data, well, you tell them. And you tell them again. And then you tell them in a convincing way and then you figure out what their weak points are and you tell them again. And I, I don't, I, you know, the change is us. So I see that it's possible in terms of the scholarship question. But I really see it as a way to, to um, you know, as for someone like myself 
who is a field researcher who collects very expensive data, and a lot of it, and it's not cheap, and budgets are flat, and we are not going to be, if you get a question about carbon sequestration, you are not going to be able to go back 20, 30 years in time and say, okay, if we do this practice for 20 or 30 years, we'll have this. And you need those historic data records, the ICE record that was mentioned, you need those things. Do we know all those things that will be relevant to a question 20 years from now? Absolutely not. Can we give it a shot? Sure, why not? Um, we'll, we'll get some things wrong, but that's okay. Okay, so, um, I, so I thought of it as a, as a kind of cover your ass strategy for an assistant associate professor, and I still think it's a good one. And it started me on some baby steps on thinking. Okay, moving to the intervening years when we joined up with libraries, we've had a number of formative experiences. We have often felt like we're tipping it, we'll milk, that this isn't fun. Um, but I think the vision has already, has always been there. I need to add one other thing about a hat I wear, is that I'm an extension specialist. And I'm not sure how many of you know what an extension specialist is, but I literally take the applied research and convert it to a recommendation that somebody would use to manage on their farm. And I primarily do this for fertilizers and nutrients and, and that kind of thing. And the typical way we do this is pretty simplistic, and the point is that it's not necessarily t data, data intensive. Um, historically, and even today, there's typically a, a, qu a question that's generated by the farmer. <laughs> they bring it to uh, you as the doctor, and you kind of diagnose the problem to the best of your ability, and oftentimes you don't have anything in particular to tell them right at that point in time if it's a new problem, so you go someplace else in space and time, and you do some research. The problem is that the research probably doesn't exactly match the farmer's question uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that you are compelled to do the general case of research, not specific to the farmer, because there are many farmers. The other is that you may not have any money at all to do that exact question, so you gotta kinda piggyback it on something else. So it doesn't look quite like the question that the farmer asked in the research, or it may not, there's a high probability. So how do you get from back to the farmer? Oops, well you think, right? And so we've had a history of sitting around and thinking as a group of extension specialists in the, in the north central region on fertilizer recommendations. Um, while we think, we also fish. And I'll bring, come back to that because uh, there's a point when, when maybe fishing becomes more important than thinking and we're not doing what we should necessarily be doing. And then there are other sources out there, uh, people who understand the wealth that exists in farming and they wanna sell them something that, that they can implement or, and they want to make money off of it, so we've got competition. And even the farmer, the farmer has become a, uh, the farm is a data rich enterprise. The farmer sometimes thinks that they have no problem dealing with their data and answering their own science questions, and many times they can. They can do some of their own on-farm research. Other times they realize I have, n I have no idea what all this stuff is coming off my equipment, uh, and they don't necessarily want to deal with it. Um, so the extension model, and I'm almost done with this little bit of background, it, it, it looks like this, you know, you've got some basic research out there that's relevant to your question. Uh, you have to do the, what's called the applied research to, to adapt um, it for the, the basic research to something that's actually useful in management. And from that research that looks a little different than the basic, you can generally, or we have generally made a recommendation that is a generalized case of the research, or we hope it's a generalized case, and sometimes that influences policy. Uh, th we have typically not had much feedback in the loop. So <laughs> this is because we're, it's, our, it's human nature to engineer, right? We deliver a solution to the farmer, you're good, right? And w we don't necessarily expect it to not turn out well. But what we found out is that, one, that's a bad idea, and that if the other thing, and this is uh, where I started my career, the other, bit, what do, do, what do I do with data, and then what do I do for recommendations? Because I was handed, these are our recommendations, they need some improvement. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna look at the quality of the science underneath the recommendation. I could not find it. I was like, holy cow, where did this come from? Uh, you, I couldn't find the data, I couldn't find the synthesis in papers. I was like, where did this come from? Well, it came from a fishing trip, where the group got together, the group of 
my counterparts got together. They had a, each had a little bit of results. They sat around and literally one of those one of those individuals had one of the first laptops with the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and the ability to a fit fit a mathematical equation to a table, and they did, and that became the recommendation. And they, then they modified it by one one person say, ah, I don't quite agree with that for Sands of Michigan. Okay, well we'll dink it this way. That's where the recommendation came from. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put it to you right now. If you were taking a $10,000 a month pharmaceutical and you thought that that was the, the strength of the evidence under that recommendation, you would feel pretty darn unhappy with that. I'm fairly certain. Stakes are pretty darn low in agriculture. So it, you know, getting people worked up about, well, the science really isn't there, has been a bit more problematic. Okay, so we got this great idea, that's, this is this first proposal, where, okay, the, the old model about how we do extension is bad. And we, draw, we, we brought in Michael Witt on this from libraries, and we're, we said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna move away from this typical model where we, you know, each I, myself, or my, maybe my predecessor even has some data, um, perhaps I put it in a paper, Ohio State, Michigan, by the way, those are the three that put together a common recommendation for fertilizers. Uh, and then we sit around, fish maybe, and we make a recommendation. And we said, okay, we had this grand idea. That's bad. Oh, uh, and th th the other th little bits and pieces you should know is that we are definitely a crew that believes or believe that data were owned by the PI. Um, we didn't have any history of sharing raw data. Uh, the other thing that's really important is this group tended to say, why peer review? And I'll tell you right now, why peer review? Because one, your interpretation gets vetted, that's the old reason why peer review. Two, your gray literature is not persistent, it's gone. So you write up little white papers on this and that result and you push them quickly to your farmer clientele, they're gone from the record. What do you do? You redo the experiment. And I have seen it, I've been around long enough to see this happen over and over and over again. The experiment is simply redone. Like, oh, that, that sounds like a bad idea. Um, okay, so we got this notion. We were gonna have, you know, this kind of system. We were gonna have the data pools be aggregated someplace magical. Uh, we would have hosted modeling, data curation, people would mine the data, and we'd produce new knowledge, better knowledge. Uh, we, we wanted preservation, curation preservation to be a core activity. Back then it wasn't big data, it was big science. I don't know if you remember this, but everybody was being convened on campuses to talk about big science and doing things collaboratively, so we were all excited about that. Okay, <laughs> boom, <laughs> greatest proposal on earth, rejected. And not only was it was rejected, it was rejected with scathing comments. And they were, I mean, people, it came through in the, in the text that people were either genuinely baffled, why would we share data, to just like outraged. Why, wh wh who on earth could make me do that? And why would I do that? It's my, it's my prerogative to keep that data unexposed to light until the day I die if that's what happens. And there are a lot of people that, that have that mentality. It's not, you know, you can say they always have a plan to use it. Yeah, no, they don't really. If they didn't really get it published soon, they're not waiting till their, you know, sunset years to actually produce an opus on it. it, they, it they, they wouldn't be able to if they, if they could even find which drawer it was in. Okay, <laughs> the mind of millennials. I want to raise this up because one, it was a shock to us, and <laughs> two, I, I think you all might be shocked if you actually <laughs> were in our position, asked some of the same questions we asked, and, and looked at what we got back. So I presume I have a 24-year-old son. Uh, I have always presumed that children born with e-devices attached to their limbs understand the e-devices that they have attached to them in some organic way, right? You know, that they have some understanding. Uh, <laughs> when we started looking hard at what our students were doing in, with data, it, it was in fact quite organic. 
Uh, and it was organic to them. It made complete sense in the moment to them. Uh, I'm sure several years after it would make no sense to them. Uh, but in the moment, it made complete sense to them. Um, th my first attempt, and this is my screenshot of my computer screen today. This was one of my graduate students who graduated in 2003. And around 2000, I, you know, I got this bold new move, right? Every graduate student is going to give me every piece of data they collect when they depart. And that will help my problem of not being able to, to follow up with them once they leave Purdue's campus. And so I just said, okay, you've got to give me all your data. And this individual, who's now an uh, associate professor at, at Wisconsin, clearly successful, gave me this folder. And I opened it up, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is math crap. <laughs> and it has, re I have asked him to come back. He's now, you know, 10 plus years out, tenured, all that. He's not coming back. He knows it. He's interested in data. He runs one of these big coordinated ag projects. But it really was and remains crap. <laughs> this is actually a more sophisticated effort from a more recent student. But this we asked her before she left. We're like, get all your data organized. She, she talked to Marianne Brackey. She, you know, get your data organized, everything annotated, and then we'll look at it and <laughs> let you know if you graduate. Not quite. But um, she, so she opens up her spreadsheet. And she, it, it's, it's, free it's, it's free play space. She has a little set of data here. She has something that's sort of related down here. Another set here. Uh, th the columns each has their own little column heading someplace. It's not really described. This is all about switchgrass. But beyond that, it's like free play. There's, this no, there's no concept that that spreadsheet has a structure. And I show you this because we're finding that's what our incoming graduate students think. And quite honestly, at Purdue, in the undergraduate curriculum, we're not teaching them not to think that way. Uh, at least not in, in agronomy. The other thing that was kind of a, a crude, uh, a bad surprise for us was how local dialects of science are. So we have a project, it's a pretty big project for ag types like us, it's a few million bucks. And we've got like 10 PIs on campus or 12 PIs. And this is Purdue's campus. You guys won't get lost if you go now. Uh, and here's the College of Agriculture. And we're in, we're in a few buildings. These are the domain scientists. They're in a few buildings. We've worked together for years. I've given them data. I've given other people data from the field station. The, the way these things happen is typically the reason I'm there is because I have the data. I can give it to modelers. And modeling's a big deal because you can't do the science everywhere in space and time. So you model the inference data. And so we work with models. So very close together, worked together for a long time. We were sitting around, and the modelers were really perplexed because their results were about 15% off of measured yield results. And they're like, how can this be? You know, it, it's pretty good, but it's they, they were actually happy. Uh, it, it just consistently is off by 15%. But it, you know, it's consistently off, so it's OK, right? And I was sitting there thinking, and all of a sudden I said, well, what? What are you assuming about the moisture content of the yield measurement? And they said, well, we assume it's zero. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. Agronomists always report maize moisture, corn moisture yields at 15.5% moisture content. It's a standard. It's an unwritten standard. It's a poorly ascribed to standard. It should be written in every single publication that reports a yield result, what moisture content stuff is, is being reported at. It is not. You can go to just about any journal, Elsevier, Professional Science Society, and find that that detail has been omitted. And so you're like, OK, whoa. So it was a bad moment. We do not have a, this came up yesterday, the railroad standards thing. The, the concept of yield, given how important it is to the entire discipline, is very, very locally defined. And we didn't even know it. And so clearly we have a problem. All right, so from what, what did we learn from this self-study? Well, the librarians, library scientists, got quite a lot out, out of this. We were a little embarrassed. But they got things like 
uh, because they were studying us uh, and others, not just us, they got the 12 uh, core competencies that should be being taught that are not being taught and that our students do not know and that we don't know, professors, faculty don't know. They also got um, uh, this data curation profiles toolkit which is literally a how-to guide, how to talk to your researcher. And yes, that is needed, how to talk to your researcher. Because your researcher assumes you think just like them. And they have, you know, Jim made the comment, every little researcher's world is entirely their own, it's all about me. So you have to understand, if you care about this, you can just say, yeah, forget about it. Um, but you'll have to figure out how the researcher you're working with thinks. And they don't have it written down. Uh, okay, finally, um, what are some of the lessons of encouraging directional stuff? Okay, so, so three little examples I wanna quickly run through and then I'll wrap up. They come from very different things. Uh, the movies, Moneyball. Uh, some work I did for food and agriculture UN Food and Agriculture Organization and uh, Johns Hopkins and their work on chemicals. And just quickly, we'll go with the fun one first, Moneyball. Seen Moneyball, it's a great movie. There's this wonderful scene about where the, these, these men are sitting around trying to figure out who to draft. And their commentary runs along the lines of, on this one particular player, they don't want to take this player, or, or somebody likes him because he's got good, you know, seems to play baseball well. Somebody doesn't like him because he lacks confidence. How do you know he lacks confidence? His girlfriend's ugly. Okay, now, I thought this was hysterical because uh, not only, well, <laughs> afterwards I, I read a really interesting article about um, why it, it was written by Michael Lewis, he did some interviews, he, he was trying to figure out a question he hadn't addressed in his book, and that's why do professionals paid so much money, make such terrible mistakes when it comes to data? And, uh, you know, he kind of went into who's researching inexplicable human behavior, why do we do this? Um, my interest in this was because it really made me think about fishing again. We are so confident when we get amongst ourselves that our collective wisdom is good, that we're done. And that's when you're in trouble. This is not unique to us at all. Um, I, I've tried to explain this to my colleagues, they're a little offended. Um, but we're not, we're not, they know we're not using all the data that we could be using. There's a lot of it, um, we, we're prone to biases. We're under the gun, we have to you know, make these, we have to extend inference space par, far beyond our knowledge base and we, we have no comfort saying I don't know. And honestly, that's really not an accepted answer by a farmer or somebody in the industry. They don't want you to say I don't know. So we're in this sort of particularly human condition. Um, we, we tend to rely on the data that we know. We're highly suspicious of data that we don't know very well. And that means if I know you and I've collaborated with you and I like you, I like your data. If I don't know you, I don't really approve of how you're going about researching a question, your data must be bad. And it's really uh, a bit of a problem. Um, our own biases have been a huge problem in making recommendations in the area in which I work. Um, you could say we, we need more rigor in training on scientific theory. I'd say absolutely correct. Uh, you, you, um, you learn scientific theory in many PhD programs via, largely via osmosis. Nobody sits you down and says, you know, we teach about ethics now, which gets a little bit at it, but I, I don't think students are paying attention. Honestly, I'm a little cynical about all of this. I don't, I don't think they're paying attention. Um, uh, best professional judgment is great. We wanna go to the doctor, we wanna know what to do, uh, but we have to be much more cognizant I'm saying this about extension specialists, I would say doctors probably too, and I'll get to that in a second, um, uh, about w w um, what, what is available out there to us to inform our knowledge and have we made a reasonable effort to acquire it. I will say that in, in, uh, in PhD and, and master's programs that, that feed into something I'm, where I may matter a student, we are not teaching statistics, 
that apply to synthesis. We still teach the you know experimental design, randomized complete block design, how that kind of thing, regression analysis. We don't we don't tend to require. They wouldn't do it on their own. More sophisticated stati statistics. Okay, conservation agriculture. Uh, in international research for development, conservation agriculture became about a decade ago the darling, the panacea. If only farmers world over would do this, they, their yields would go up, their livelihoods would improve, there would be more food secure, blah, blah, blah. The, the, the three pillars are you must thou, thou shalt, and literally you can find where this is referred to in the, in the extension literature is God's blanket, it's God's blanket to do this, um, is rotate your crops, do not till the soil, do not remove the residue. And this was the recipe, and this has been hugely problematic as a, as an, as a development initiative for many reasons, from shifting, shifting uh, manual labor loads for, to women and children to uh, uh, <laughs> many people use, have to remove the residue because they, they burn it, their livestock eat it, they whatever or land tenure arrangements don't give them any control over it. So so this was just a complete. I mean, it's a fantastic example of development run amok. And I was asked by the food and agricultural uh, industry, uh, food and agricultural organization of the UN, um, and it's the really that's the Independent Science and Partnership Council that oversees all the mega uh, international research centers that that look at ag and development initiatives um, to, to look at the simple question of does conservation agriculture increase yield? If they stick with it, will it increase yield? Disadoption was huge, hugely problematic, and it was a very simple question. There was a lot of great theory out there to say why it was bad, it was published, but the question was, uh, you know, does the science support it? So it was actually doing something that I want to enable with my own data, I want to enable somebody else to do. So now is my turn to go back and say, can I do this? Well, okay, so the whole system is really complicated. When you look at all the possible ways these three practices can influence biology and physiochemistry on the ground, how they interact with, uh, not just with weather, but with cultural, important cultural aspects. So it's very complex. But when we looked at the literature, you know, we just really couldn't find anything. I mean, we could not find the data that supported, yes, it does increase yield, uh, and that was looking at a lot of data, both from within our targeted regions, which were Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, but also looking everywhere in the world. We couldn't necessarily find the linkages that we wanted to. So the bottom line is, when you look at this, and it's a toolkit in this complex system that farmers manage, when you look at it, we simply cannot tell them what to do. To me, that's actually, a, devastating because that's what I'm hired to do and I don't have the money to do it but I'm like my, my contributing piece maybe they can't use my contributing piece and so you know the reasons it was <laughs> devastating uh, quality of science wasn't very good even if you can find it and when you're looking at trying to make a recommendation we, we have a fundamental flaw in our system and with peer review and that is the peer review emphasizes the novel result when you're looking at synthesis, you want to look at the preponderance of evidence that supports doing something. If there is a lot of evidence that supports doing X, but it never ma makes it into the literature because you can't publish it once it's been published, what, what happens? You can't do those syntheses. So either you have to be able to access the raw data that people collect when they're doing um, adaptive management research. It's not a term I like, but it's out there. Um, there are other problems, but the, uh, with, with stuff not getting into the peer review literature. Um, a huge problem is even just trying to find the stuff. In science, we use a bunch of, in, you know, a broad array of analogous terms to describe what we're doing. And not only that, we love to make it sound new by making up a new term. Typically some sort of boxcar term. The journals don't tell us no. They may go in and try to do some tagging after we've put in our keywords and stuff like that. 
Um, but it's extremely difficult to search the literature. You get back, you have to search very broadly. You get back, you know, it, this, in this example, this is rather constrained search. You've, this, this student used 104 keyword combos, got back, you know, 4,500 papers, and 93 were actually relevant to the question he was trying to get stuff on. Um, if you're going for a bigger question than he was going for, you will get back a million. You have to have really kind of uh, high, finely honed inclusion, exclusion criteria, et cetera. Uh, we also found that people just weren't reporting stuff. I know that we should be doing this, and it says so when you're trying to publish a paper, you should do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, but it's amazing what people aren't recording that is, the, uh, is part of good agronomy. And uh, I think we need to be very careful about uh, the publishing process, but, but also about what we, what we think is, is important to get into papers. Um, there was no infrastructure for data sure, stewardship and sharing with the, within the CGIAR. Now they have a huge initiative on open data, and they are struggling with all the things we are struggling. Um, there was also this issue of the need for being able to do those sy systematic meta-analyses, which require data infrastructure. And that's my last little point, and then I'll wrap up. And that is the Tamiflu, Tamiflu medical example. And we were looking for a keynote speaker for a wonderful conference that we tried to bring all stakeholders together for um, outside of DC. And we had people lined up from all the funding agencies and DOE and NASA and blah, blah, blah to talk about those interests in, in, in ag data. And we unfortunately held it during the government shutdown. Uh, so only about half of our audience showed up, but it was a great conference. And we learned a lot. We got a lot of great information out of people in working groups. But we, fa we, we found Kay via the New York Times. We needed a keynote speaker to talk about the importance of data. And so she came and she talked about the Cochrane Collaborative at, um, at uh, Johns Hopkins and what they do to translate knowledge. And if you know the Tamiflu example, you know that, uh, that the Cochrane Collaborative reviewed lots and lots of studies in a very systematic way. And they found that in spite of the good intentions and the dollars of the US to protect us from death in a pandemic, Tamiflu will not protect you from death. It may shorten your symptoms a little bit, but it does not protect you from death. And so we might want those tax dollars back. The point that Kay made were entirely relevant to us. Uh, research evidence is in these short little published papers. <laughs> we try to publish a lot of them. Um, literature is large and growing. It's not organized. It's not organized. Um, and reviews of primary research are necessary for, co for coping with the information overload. Um, this was an earlier study of medicine, which should make you a little nervous, except it's a long time ago. Typical half day of practice uh, for clini clinical decisions would have been altered if clini clinically useful information were available. Uh, I understand that it's really not changed. And most, uh, <laughs> most clinical, uh, clinician information needs are still met by fishing trips. Ask a colleague. Okay? And this Cochrane Collaborative is, is I think it's like 20% or 30% of the pe doctors actually know about it and, and use it. Uh, so we're not using the information. If we look at their extension model, it's very similar to ours, except that it has the synthesis piece. Well, what is that synthesis piece? It's a lot of cataloging and information organization. And we want it. We want it to do our job better. I'm not going to go into any of the details, but yes, there is research that's done with the cataloged and organized information, but it's impossible without the cataloging and organization. So very simply, we want that model. We want to have on the ground this sort of notion where we're, we're, we're having evidence-based agriculture that's this next nexus of, of the stakeholder values or priorities, management expertise, um, and the best research evidence. Sounds great. Um, again, this is a little poor sketch on my part, but it changes, the point is the change in the knowledge translation pathway to a recommendation you have this organizational infrastructure at the base that informs the basic research to do, the applied research to do. It identifies the knowledge graph. It, it allows the synthesis on top of it into a recommendation using the best science. 
it enables feedback, all these glorious things. But the main thing is that at its core, it's got this organizational infrastructure. Uh, and that's what I'd like. Okay, where are we now? This note was handed to Jeff Olenek in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago by a colleague when D Jeff was explaining to them a pilot study where we are going to try to help them get their data, have their data ingested into a repository. Uh, I know this, this individual is suspicious. Uh, <laughs> he is not keen. And so where are we in terms of uh, agronomy, the broad discipline of agronomy, uh, we're still in the earliest stages. Maybe not the terrible twos, but we still have a bunch of people out there who just say, why bother? Not useful, not gonna do it. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons they offer up under that. I think there are many more who are just simply in despair. Great idea, but how? You know, my stuff isn't accessible. These, these quotes come from uh, Florian Diekman, who's at, with libraries at Ohio State, who interviewed crop scientists about whether or not they'd be able to do this. And, you know, couldn't find it, lost it. Uh, technician did it and went away, that human resources problem. Misplaced it. Uh, if you saw my office, you'd think that was possible. Um, then there's the, the realistically morose. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. How am I going to do it? Um, uh, I have to explain what I did. Uh, first, I have to know what I did and recall what I did. Um, and then there is the willing but the show me the dollars. And I think that's a, uh, that's a very, very real barrier that we're going to have to make an attempt to crawl over. Because if we can't figure out how to cost this, it's not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, money, motivation, mechanics, it all washes into that. Um, my little simplistic vision of what we need is founded on a data repository. Uh, or some data infrastructure that gets us all organized as a domain. And not just as a domain, for other domains. Because this business of other, other domains, you, ag econ economists use agricultural data all the time. Uh, modelers who have no understanding of the field use it all the time. So this business of other scientists, I work in a dom domain where other scientists use their, our stuff all the time to do things like predict food security in Ghana in 2030. It's not, it, it's not trivial, it's not necessarily done well, so we have needs, and all of them um, are, involve skill sets that my domain does not have. This is not what we do. We could, this, this thing about uh, sacrificing people to learn this stuff so that they could help us, um, is viable. The, the question of repositories, um, Saeed's comment yesterday that a repository um, might at best be a baby step. I understand that completely, but understand my level of sophistication, right? So we've looked at, we, we simply want safe, secure place where we can find and reuse our stuff, our data are organized, blah, 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 right? Um, we've looked at a bunch of different models as we've thought about it, so we do know a little bit about what's out there in terms of data one, which is, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily got a persistence model in there, Dryad, but then they're not really interested in anything that, that's associated, that's not pub with, with, it's not a pu associated with a pub. Access, this is our professional societies. They're looking at it, they're kind of quasi-interested if they could figure out how to make money, which is ironic. Okay, they want to make money. All right, well, I get it. I mean, they have to be self-sufficient, but they actually want to make money. Um, and then there's the, um, you know, National Ag Libraries, but they're very clear. They're, they're, they're coming along just like we are. Um, and then we have our Purdue University Research Repository, um, where you know we're not quite sure what's going to happen. But I think I'll close with making a couple comments. Why libraries? You know, okay, a library, a dis distributed repository system that includes libraries. Well, this again is my, my naive, unsophisticated view of libraries. But I believe the skill sets are right. The thought processes they're different than our own, and they are incredibly important to us. Um, they have the same professional value system. We are in, the, we being agronomists who work in extension, make recommendations, we are in the public goods and services business. And so I don't create stuff that, that has any prayer of being labeled IP. Uh, it's a public good and service. And I think library has this 
libraries have this public good and service. They also have an expectation on the part of the public of persistence, infallibility, endurance, organization. And why that's important is not just that it's a perception of value, but we, you guys actually get funding for it, right? I mean, there's some funding. We, we have libraries today because people believe that libraries do a good public service and they support collections. May not be enough. Um, final comment, per, uh, is it a baby step? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, that's beyond my, my, my vision. Uh, it's, to me, it, it's the greatest tool for agronomy since the randomized complete block design. Um, should agronomists be using, using more sophisticated analyses? Absolutely, we should be all be doing sophisticated multivariate analyses using Bayesian statistics, all that kind of stuff. We're still only taught randomized complete block design. Uh, but it, it, it is a, such an advance for us that it, it, it's great. So um, last thought, and that is the one thing that we are learning, the one thing I've learned a lot that I will say is the biggest mistake we still make is this notion, and I say we because I still see it being made by those who are trying to help me. This notion of build it and they will come. Go ahead and build it. We will not come. <laughs> um, I, I, it's really important to understand. It's not because we don't see the general value. We don't see the pathway. And you may be extremely pained by the pathway you have to hold our hand along, but hang in there with us. You know, I think there, there's tremendous value to agriculture, to humanity, to food security in my area. If we can, if we can do some of these things together. Um, we have a, a couple, a few pilots going on right now. And the thing, the key thing that, that we're trying to implement is to, to not make this mistake, is that we realize we, we can't expect people to just show up with their data. So we are taking the data buddy approach. We are going to send someone to projects to hold their hand, to interview out of them what their needs are, to walk with them, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, to get them to do it. I don't think it's that hard, but they will not take the first step without this. And that's where I am going to end. Uh, 30 years ago, May, myself and my rooming group. And thank you, and any questions? Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, well, a uh, common and a couple of questions. W first, that the CGIR, we're working with them with the Dataverse, and they have a Dataverse install. They're making the, uh, we're helping them making the data accessible for that. Just notice that I, it was I not mentioned. I should acknowledge uh, that I'm currently uh, reviewing two of the coordinated research projects. Okay. So I know all about the. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I will talk about that this afternoon, but yeah, I just yeah. wanted to. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, for the for the, the the openness about data sharing, it's uh, sort of a concerning the way you I mean you you show a reality right in within that field, uh, and we've seen uh, a difference in other fields right uh, yeah, with absolutely. a cultural change going on. So I, I I wonder if there is again a misunderstanding of what open needs to be or, or what accessi uh, data accessibility needs to be. And also, uh, um, yes, I also mentioned the, the emphasis on data citation. So, so first, the one thing is that the, um, the scholarly norm uh, in terms of how do you get credit over, over the last decades have been a lot based on, the, on how many citations you have mm -hmm. uh, in publications. If, if uh, one could take data at that level and think of it also as a publication uh -huh. that you get citation, there is then an, uh, 
an incentive right, right, to, right. To, uh, to want to share that. And sharing uh, or making it accessible doesn't mean necessarily that it's open to, for anybody to use. So I, th I think the important difference is to say that there, there should be sufficient uh, metadata for discoverability, uh, discoverability that, these, uh, that those data sets exist so somebody else doesn't go and and build a, well, start doing duplicating the, the effort, or they, uh, at least they have a chance to see if you, I collaborate with you, would I be able to access some part of that data? Or if, uh, I mean, maybe it's a monetary thing, or maybe it's a collaboration, or, or there are other incentives to then uh, provide access to the data. So if the data, the, the data author has control over that, then it could provide, a, again, an, a way to feel more open, to <laughs> okay, at least make so that discoverable. So, uh, so I'm not actually think? sure which particular, I mean, th there are many comments that I could make in response to that comment, but uh, the, uh, you know, open access I I to me is a largely unsettled term. It's going to mean different things in different situations to different people. Uh, w we work a little bit with uh, data that are um, protected, I it's not n anywhere near as in other disciplines, but there are certain things that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has promised farmers they will not make available. It often has to do with georeferencing, or therefore their farm is, and things like that, which make it difficult to, to place a, a farm and a farm's results, uh, if you're taking data off the farm, in, in biophysical space. But, um, so, so I think, you know, what, what does open access mean? The, the different disciplines, we work in a discipline where, where uh, we're largely funded by grants and contracts. Who owns the data? I've always been one of those people who's very clear, I do not own the data. Uh, I, I do the project. Uh, Purdue as an institution has a contact with me. Uh, but should I leave, Purdue, the data would stay at Purdue. Um, and, you know, there, there's variations on that, but I think um, the, the ownership, the open access, the sharing, how do you, I, I simply cannot, you know, this notion of can I, can I, can I have people buy data off of me? Uh, not in Purdue's mind right now. Uh, if it were mine, I could, I could do that, but I, it's not something that is easy, and we've talked extensively about business models on how to share data. It, I realize it's discipline specific, some of the concerns, um, it's also the area in which I work, which is dedicated to uh, public goods and service, where, le where leadership of funding organizations have said all data, after an X embargo period, all data will be made publicly available, or publicly accessible to a certain extent. But I, to me, you know, that doesn't mean that I could set up shop and sell it. Uh, I have no mechanism to do so. Uh, uh, there should be an obligation by uh, by the scientific community to at least make uh, make it possible to make that data uh, data available, right? Accessible mm -hmm. because it's part of the validation and part of uh, mm -hmm. what makes your research accountable. Mm -hmm. So my point was that that I'm I'm surprised that there is at least not not at that level to say I will make that discoverable. Uh, uh, who who can actually access it? It could be a different story, and then it depends on every case. So, yeah. uh, well, but you haven't seen that uh, the the, at least the willing of making uh, the 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 citation and some level of metadata po uh, accessible to others to understand what is in it and and have a, a, a system to be able to access it for whoever. I, I've needs seen to people be willing to do it in organic networks that they've set up themselves where they agree to post their data together and make it securely accessible. The, the, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and their recent, um, the, the AFRI-NIFA funding organization, their recent RFAs sh say that you must put your data from this project into the data, com the, what do they call it, data commons or, uh, and or put it into a repository where others may use it. So wh what that translates into in terms of policy is entirely not worked out by either the agency or the contracting organization, which would be Purdue. But the, the, uh, the intent with which it is bring, being brought to those of us who do that type of research is that you need to make your data not just searchable 
but, but usable by others who have other questions. Okay, with that, we'll break. Thank you very much, Jenny. You're welcome.